Hello, I'm Dr. John Warner, President of the American Heart Association. I'm here today with Paul Welton, who's the chair of the writing group for the new Hypertension Clinical Practice Guidelines, who were just released uh, today at Scientific Sessions. Congratulations on such an impactful publication and for you, your John. work and the, and the rest of the writing group's work on this important publication. Thank you very much. It's been a while since we've had an update of the Hypertension Guidelines since 2003. Maybe you could give us a little context around the, the need for the guidelines and an overall view of why they were put forward. Certainly, you're, you're correct. The last comprehensive guidelines were 2003, and of course, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, sponsored these guidelines for many years and did a great job. In 2013, they elected to pass that responsibility over to American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. And uh, then they assembled a number of partner organizations uh, during that year and assembled our group, the writing group, in 2014. 21 member multidisciplinary group, two lay members, uh, all of them very, very engaged and active. And then we spent about two to three years uh, we reviewed about a thousand studies. Uh, it was a very yeah. intense uh, process, but we're very happy now to have the guideline out. And hopefully it'll be helpful to clinicians and to the uh, adults in the U.S. population. I think they certainly will be. Tell us a little bit about some of the big changes in the guidelines, things that you think will change practice based on their publication. Right. Well, certainly a big change is classification. And the last time we had a new classification in blood pressure was 1993, so maybe it's time. And, you know, we have new information now that at a lower level than we would classify hypertension before, that is a systolic of 130 to 139 or a diastolic of 80 to 89. That's already high risk, and we call that stage one hypertension. And we have a lot of trials that show this benefit from reducing below those levels of blood pressure. So that's a big change. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we take those who are above 140 systolic and above 90 diastolic and label them as stage two hypertension. So that's a big change. Normal is the same as before. 120, below 120 systolic, below 80 diastolic. And then we have a group of elevated blood pressure between normal and stage one. So it's a new system. It'll take a while to get used to it, but I think it's the right system. It'll capture those at risk better than our former system. Sure, that's very clear. So previously, would have, we would have called those people that were elevated uh, pre-hypertension. Why is it important for us to change that nomenclature right. so that people understand the impact of looking at blood pressure a different way? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the upper end of what was previously pre-hypertension or in earlier guidelines, high normal blood pressure, we didn't like those terms because it suggests that you're still okay, you're pre-hypertension, you don't have it yet, or you're high normal, but you're normal. And uh, it was clear from the information that's available now that you're not normal. You're in that stage one category at about twice the risk for a heart attack as somebody with a normal blood pressure. So that's why we changed it. That and the, and the knowledge that lowering blood pressure in that category would be helpful to individuals. What advice would you give for clinicians as they begin to use these new guidelines? Obviously, there'll be a change because they'll be, particularly in that elevated category, um, you know, those are folks that will now give a diagnosis of hypertension to. And uh, what do you expect their, your, what's your advice to the clinicians so they can give their advice right. to their patients about what to do next? Well, of course, the first advice is accurate measurement of blood pressure because we as clinicians don't do such sure. a good job. And, in order to really make decisions to label somebody as hypertensive, to help them to understand what treatments are necessary, we need accurate measurements and we need to get measurements on more than one occasion to get the average estimate of what the body is seeing in terms of blood pressure. I think then once we identify the new group in stage one hypertension, it's very important to understand whether they are otherwise at low risk for cardiovascular disease or they're at high risk. Either they've had an event, they've had a stroke or a heart attack, which keeps them at high risk, or they haven't had that, but on a calculation using the standard risk factors, they're at high risk. They have more than a 10% chance of getting a major event in the next 10 years. So 
If they're otherwise at low risk, then non-drug or lifestyle changes should be very sufficient, important but very sufficient for that person. For the minority, and it's about 30% in that class one uh, or stage one hypertension, they will benefit not only from lifestyle change, but from an antihypertensive drug as well. The one thing I like about the text of the guidelines is they really embrace the idea of involving patients in the, man mm -hmm. in the management of their own blood pressure and the lifestyle changes that need to come along with, uh, with changing their cardiovascular risk. Uh, what do you think uh, your advice would be for patients as they begin to sort of see these new recommendations and how they might uh, you know, become more engaged in their own health? Well, you're absolutely right. I think very important that it's a team activity. Uh, a lot of people are, and the provision of care and also the patient is an important part of the care. And what we realize now increasingly is that office blood pressures are very helpful. They are what all of our trials are based on, is what most of us take. But we now know that measurements outside the office, which the patient can take, are really valuable to confirm the diagnosis of high blood pressure, to spot where so-called white coat hypertension is occurring. They're, they're high in the office, but their pressures are normal outside. That those sorts of people seem to have the same risk as normotensives. And the more insidious problem where the, measure, the measurement of blood pressure seems to be normal in the office, but it's quite high outside, so-called mass hypertension, where individuals have about the same risk as sustained hypertension. So the patient is, I think, really important at all aspects of diagnosis, understanding the true exposure of the body to blood pressure, and then, of course, in the therapy of those who have high blood pressure. The, uh, I think that's great advice, and uh, you know, it, I, as I read these and think about them, they'll raise some new questions, I think, for, for clinicians as well as patients. What do you, what do you think is next for, in terms of looking at, uh, at risk and next frontiers in terms of us in terms of thinking about the next step for clinical trials and questions that remain unanswered by the current literature? Well, I have to say we need to empower everybody and make it easy for everybody. So clinicians are being asked to do a lot, whether they're physicians or nurses or they're uh, pharmacists. We need to try to make it easy for them. And I think certainly in things like uh, risk calculation, yeah. we ought to be able to get that into the electronic medical record. And uh, I think uh, as we go down the pike, uh, we want to try to help as much as we can. And one of the great things American Heart does for patients as well as for clinicians is they've got a treasure trove of very useful information, especially when it comes to things like lifestyle change. For any patient, they uh, have it within their power to make those changes, and American Heart is very helpful in directing them how to make those changes. Well, congratulations on a great set of guidelines. I, I really think these are incredibly well written, very clear, and. Uh, and I think they'll clearly do a lot to educate not only clinicians but the public around the risk of, of hypertension as it relates to cardiovascular disease and stroke. And really offers a lot of information that I think will uh, be dedicated to improve the lives of others. So congratulations on a very uh, significant accomplishment. Thank and you. we look forward to hearing more throughout the sessions about all the, uh, the work that's gone on behind the scenes to, uh, to translate these into clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Warner. Thank you.